We will go ahead and call to order the December 7th, 2023 meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission. Welcome. Uh, can we have the roll, please? Chairman Lane. Here. Commissioner Sibley. Here. Commissioner Fenster. Here. I don't think my speaker's on. There we go. <laughs> Commissioner Jacoby. Here. Commissioner Barnard. Here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We do have a quorum. Uh, first order of business is approval of the November 2nd, 2023 meeting minutes. Do any commissioners have any comments or questions concerning those minutes? None. And if no, I would entertain a motion. So moved. Okay. Second. So okay. I have a motion to approve the minutes from Commissioner Fencer and a second from Commissioner Jacoby. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. The minutes are approved. Thank you. Uh, report from the chair. I don't have anything specific to um, review. So we'll pass that time to uh, communications from HPC staff liaison. What do you have for us tonight? Just a couple of things. And I think uh, Glenn's going to tag on with a, a couple items after I'm finished. So um, the first item is the um, 554 Collier Street um, denial um, of certificate of appropriateness and certificate of hardship. Um, I did send an email to the commission out. It has been appealed. So um, we will be back at city council. Um, to discuss this item with that appeal at the uh, d December 19th meeting. So that is when that will be on the agenda. So we're getting that package put together right now. Um, and the other thing is really tagging on to an, a tagging on to one of our presentations tonight, just as sort of a setting the stage, um, the Tower of Compassion. We're starting to talk, we're, we're beginning discussion with our Parks Department staff since it is their asset um, as far as you know, getting that process started since it is, you know, has been determined to be eligible for landmarking. Um, ultimately, City Council would have to recommend that and be the, one, the decision maker that we could pursue it. Um, so we're basically starting those internal discussions now. Um, and then in terms of the survey plan, um, working with our on-call consultant to finalize that particular scope. They have a um, historic preservation um, subcontractor they use, so we are finalizing the scope of that. So we should be in good shape to get moving on that at the beginning of the year. Great. Uh, Mr. Chair and um, HPC members, at the last meeting there was a question about the southwest corner of Collier and 3rd Avenue. That was there and then it wasn't. Um, so we did look into that. Uh, the applicant did go through the process that he was supposed to go through or he was asked to go through. He submitted his application, he paid his fees, he uh, worked with utility companies on shutting off the utilities. He got his asbestos mitigation taken care of. He went to planning staff to talk about the existing trees, but it did not proceed to the liaison and our council liaison to give it a look to see if it's potentially landmark worthy. It was uh, built in 1925. Um, it's been there on the corner. It's been surrounded by industrial commercial type uses. Um, and I think um, it was a miss and the staff missed it primarily because we have brand new people in the permit counter um, and then some a few in the planning department. So when we figured out that it was a miss, um, the other uh, issue we found out was we have a permit system that is kind of our last stop to catch and make sure we do things. It's geared for landmarks. If there's a potential landmark, boom, red lights go off. But on the 50 years or older, it does not go off. 
So we've sat down with staff and explained to them this is a particular area when you're looking at the, the, uh, the town site, not just the Hennon neighborhood, not the west side, but it extends further, it extends south of 3rd Avenue. And I think in staff's mind, they think of the residential areas as the protection zone. So anyhow, we've clar uh, clarified it with staff and we're working to put that stop gap into our Excel permit system. Anything within the original town site gets flagged and it's gonna fall in Jennifer's lap basically to take a look at. So, um, and then, uh, I mean, going forward after we get that fix, uh, the survey plan is, is a big part of making sure we, if there is something that is landmark worthy, we identify it. There's no surveys done on this property. We even checked the state um, because it was a state highway. Um, so I thought, well, potentially it got picked up there, but um, we don't have any kind of report on it. So I did want to clarify that with you, let you know what happened. We did look into it and we're taking steps to make sure it doesn't happen again. But I'd be happy to answer any questions, you know, the commissioners might have. All right. Thanks for that. Um, commissioners, any questions or comments? No. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Jacoby. Commissioner Jacoby. There we go. Yeah. Uh, as far as the Tower of Compassion, I, I naively suggested making that a, a landmark at our retreat and in time for the uh, Historic Preservation Month, which was last May. Are we going to be able to coordinate that, do you think, by this May for the Historic Preservation Month? I don't know the answer to that question, but it's a goal that I mean, we'll hopefully have a better idea of where we are. Okay. So if it's, I mean, I don't know that we could meet all the various um, public hearing and notice requirements at this point. However, um, we'll certainly try and see what we can do. <laughs> it's, right, uh, because there are other departments involved and other moving parts, we just need to. I can't. I can't commit to when we could have it done simply because so much of it's out of my hands. Sure, there's lots of priorities. Probably more important than Historic Preservation Month, but I think we should try to keep that in the back of our mind and try to get it sure. there by then if we can. It's a good yeah. goal. All right, thank you. Even if it lands on council by that time, if it's not executed. Just It'd be very be. symbolic, yeah. Yeah. Just a couple other things, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. um, on Tuesday, we're presenting uh, for the first time, Council, your amended uh, um, ordinance. So that'll happen, and then we hopefully won't get a whole lot of questions, a whole lot of changes, and we'll proceed to put it on the agenda for adoption. And then you have a new Council liaison. It will be Mayor Peck um, going forward in 2024. So that was a committee change just uh, this week when they had their reorganization or their organization meeting. Okay. That's it. Um, regarding the, the zero reading, will that be at council or in our study session, your presentation? It will be at the regular meeting, but it will be under general business. Okay. So it is not on the agenda for first or second reading. This right. is what we call zero. So we'll present it, we gave them the draft, the red line draft, and I'll go through it um, and hopefully, and uh, Jeremy will be there and hopefully we can answer any questions that might come up. Okay, uh, let's see. Commissioner Jacoby, you had a question? Yeah, um, so uh, with the uh, updates on the code, is that going to include the recommendation we made previously about, uh, let's see. What was it? It was for uh, waiving the fees for uh, conservation overlays for designated neighborhood groups that we discussed and we approved as a commission. Is that going to be on the list of uh, updates that you're going to present? Uh, no, it's just what you've been reviewing for the last several months. No, the amendments actually to the Historic Preservation Code, but there's nothing about fees in there. I know you yeah. asked to amend the land development code right. at some point, but no, it's not a part of That's not going to be set. part of the recommended amendments. Okay. No. And that's because why? 
Well, I think when we talked about that, that's, that has to be a direction from council. And I think um, the council liaison brings that forward to council and says, or we bring it forward when we get to the budget and say, it's now on our work plan, but that direction comes from city council as far as amendments to the code. So all those amendments that we reviewed were already yes. reviewed? Okay. Yes, for all right. many years. Yeah, I'm sure. Several years. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Okay, no other questions for staff? Thank you for all of that information. Um, we'll now open up the uh, public invited to be heard. Um, we don't have any public hearings, so I don't have to tell you that it's not for something that's uh, otherwise on the agenda. Um, so I do have a list here, and if there's anyone that's not on the list, we, we can accommodate at the end. Um, the first speaker I have here is uh, Bob McLaughlin. If you would come up, uh, you please state your name uh, and address, and uh, you'll have uh, three minutes to uh, provide comment. Thank you. Member of the Historic Preservation Commission and staff, my name is Bob McLaughlin. I live at 620 Emory Street, and I'm here to speak to you on behalf of the Historic Eastside Neighborhood Association, or HENA. Let me first apologize for my speech impediment as a result of a stroke in the spring. I'm not sensitive about the issue, so please ask me to repeat myself if you don't understand something that I say. Hannah is committed to fostering a sense of community in our neighborhood. Eastside residents share a connection through the architecture of our properties and the development pattern in the neighborhood as a whole. The Eastside has the largest concentration of intact houses from Longmont's early development period. From the mid-1980s until the zoning change in 2018, the architecture of the east side was protected by its unique RLE zoning designation. Those protections disappeared in 2018. Creating a conservation overlay district merely recreates the protections that were part of the RLE zone. A CO district allows more flexibility and can apply to a larger area than when qualify for a local historic district. At a pre-application conference in April, Hannah asked for changes in three requirements of the CO district. Number one, waive notification to property owners outside the proposed district. Creating a CO district will have no effect on the properties outside its boundaries. Number two, since Hannah is a registered neighborhood group in Longmont, waive payment of the more than $2,000 in administrative fees. And number three, make changes to the section on residential lot coverage. However, we have not found a suitable alternative to the lot coverage language. So at this time, we do not ask for any change in the lot coverage section. The Conservation Overlay District has been the land use code since the 1990s, but it has never been used in Longmont. This is not an issue for a single neighborhood. We will use this tool now, but it can be useful to several other older neighborhoods in the future. I'm here tonight to ask you to take the final action on changes to the language in the land development code related to the Conservation Overlay District. I also want to add something based on the last comment from uh, the staff. Um, the city council on September 5th, uh, it was moved by Joan Peck and seconded by Sean McCoy to direct the staff to bring back the conservation overlay rezoning for the historic east side at a regular meeting after the Historic Preservation Commission made its ruling. And it was approved 7-0. I'll allow a few extra seconds if okay. you can wrap up. Uh, that's really the end of my comments. But it was approved by all council members. Um, so I feel that direction has been given to staff to uh, take on this project. I'll uh, thank you for, for the uh, opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. 
Uh, Ms. Clark. Oh, d d no? Okay. Uh, Paula Fitzgerald. Commission, uh, pleasure to be here tonight. My name is Paula Fitzgerald and I live at 419 Emory Street in the Henna neighborhood. Um, first, thank you for... Oops, sorry. Uh, that, that's my bad. I don't use this I'm too often. I'm <laughs> Does a hook yeah, come out? Sorry. Yeah, no. <laughs> Only at city council. Then. Oh, okay, okay. I'm good then. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. So... Um, I feel like I'm speaking to the choir because I think we both have the same goals, which is historic preservation. Um, for Henna, as, as Bob has mentioned, we've had some protection or we had some protections uh, starting in the 1980s with the RLE zone. And then uh, when we ch were changed to residential single family, that went away. We were insured by staff at that time that they would come back and rectify that situation, which is now we're talking about five years and still yet to be done. So we decided to move forward on our own. So asking for a waiver of fee and notification area, I think are, um, are pretty, pretty easy asks. Um, again, we're not a development, so it's not going to um, affect anything. We're just asking for conservation and preservation of what we have right now. So it's not like we're asking for development review or plan review or any of that sort of thing. Then the notification area, as Bob mentioned, uh, it's not going to affect anybody outside of our neighborhood. I don't know how that could possibly happen. So I think both of those are pretty simple requests and hopefully you support that in forwarding that information to council. Um, so I ask that you recommend approval of these requests for waiver to City Council and we can move forward with this. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I worked for the city for 22 years in parks and my last project before I retired was the Tower of Compassion, the improvement there. With the change of staff um, and you know just so many new people, there's some historic information there. If anyone has any questions on that, I'm more than happy to help you with that. It's a near and dear project to me, and I think it totally deserves historic designation. So I support you on that. Thanks so much. Thank you. I didn't get here in time to sign up. Sharon O'Leary, 534 Emory Street. Um, historic preservation, your job description on the city website says, consider matters relating to protecting and enhancing and preserving properties of historic, geographic, or architectural significant significance in the city. Um, historic buildings are tangible links to the past. Historic Eastside neighborhood is the oldest neighborhood in Longmont. Small, humble homes close to the railroad as people made their fortune or better fortune, west side, larger homes. Our neighborhood is intact because of our old zoning. And on a promise and commitment with our neighborhood, working together with the city, we worked on zoning and the ball's been dropped. And it's beginning to feel uncomfortable at this point. Um, we went for a pre-meeting and um, the way, the need to have the fee waived is important. We're not an HOA. Um, so I have done everything as co-chair in the neighborhood by the books. I'm in N NGLA. I applied for a grant. I had to present my idea to all the other neighborhoods. They approved it. They gave us money to continue to do historical surveys. They gave us money to do the mailings, to contact our neighborhood, to inform them about, about a conservation overlay zone, and then another mailing to go ahead and do the voting. We also held our neighborhood picnic, and it was received with overwhelming response we want to preserve our neighborhood. Um, so what we're asking is that, um, I agree with Bob, I think there was a discrepancy in information that was given out tonight. 
Um, Mayor Peck made a motion to bring it back to uh, HPC, and I think it was seconded by Aaron Rodriguez. So it's just time to move forward. We need your help so we can finish this process, spend the money we've been given by the city because the citizens of the city thought it was a very good idea. Um, so we can't move ahead until the code is changed. We need to, ha to have the uh, accommodation accommodation of the fee waiver and the area that needs to be notified. And this isn't just self-centered. I think like uh, Paula or Bob mentioned, down the line, other neighborhoods will want it. And NGLA is, is the liaison of city to neighborhood. And we're playing everything by the rules, and we always have. And now I'm coming to the new, next leg of the ladder, and that's historic preservation, and the ball's in your court, and you need to direct back to city council that you approve the changes. So I appreciate your time, but let's really, let's carry on with preservation. Every year we lose opportunities. So I think we've been really patient, and now we're asking you to move forward. Thank you for your time. I, I really appreciate this commission. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? I don't see anybody else uh, for up here for public comments, so I'll go ahead and uh, close the public invited to be heard. Uh, we do not have any uh, items that are public hearings, so we'll move on to next item of new business, uh, which is our Tower of Compassion Cultural Resource Survey. To the commission. Um, so following direction from the commission about um, per looking into the possible landmarking of the Tower of Compassion, we um, commissioned Carl McWilliams to conduct a cultural resources survey um, of this asset. And uh, he is here tonight to share with you his findings um, about this particular property, um, this particular structure. Um, so thought you would be interested in hearing about this in terms of the process for where we are from the city. This is because this is a parks uh, maintain. This is basically a parks asset because it is in Kanemoto Park. Um, we are having discussions internally with park staff to, um, you know, as I mentioned in my staff report, determine a, a path forward for, for preservation of this property. So with that, I am going to invite Mr. McWilliams up to the podium uh, to talk about his findings. Just on the wheel. Um, Carl McWilliams with Cultural Resource Historians. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you for having me. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, research and survey uh, what's one of the most interesting resources or projects I've ever really had the opportunity uh, to do. In my mind, I kind of have like a top five or ten list of the many projects that I've done over the past several years, and I'm kind of have to kind of have move some property out of that to move this in because it really is a special property. It has such a, a rich, rich history. Um, I'm sure you're probably all somewhat familiar with uh, the history of the property, but I'll maybe just give a quick overview. Um, the story starts with uh, Garuku uh, Kanemoto, uh, uh, who immigrated from Japan in 1907 uh, by way of Mexico. Uh, he was originally planning to go to Canada, but he got off the train at Denver's Union Station when he learned that there might be a possibility of work on a railroad crew that had a Japanese uh, foreman. And um, so that's why he got off the, the train in Denver. Uh, in 1920, he, or in 1910, he was actually uh, working as a coal miner in northern New Mexico. Uh, but by um, the mid 1910s, he'd uh, come back to Colorado and was in the Canfield area in south of Longmont here, where he was working as a farm laborer. Um, in 1916, his family in Japan arranged uh, for a young Japanese woman uh, to become his bride in an arranged marriage. Uh, they gave birth to three children uh, who um, later adopted the Anglo names of uh, Jimmy, Faith, and George. Um, they farmed uh, in the Canfield area and then moved somewhat closer to Longmont here near the sugar factory uh, by 1930. And they uh, were tenant farmers uh, during that time. And um, 
but in 1935, Garuku died in an automobile accident, leaving uh, uh, um, Satsuno and uh, three uh, teenage children. And um, they persevered. They opened up a kind uh, of. Um, I'll kind of show you some of the family here. This is the uh, family uh, early 1920s with uh, Garuku and Satsuno and the, and the three children. Jimmy's on the left, uh, George is in the middle, and, and Faith is on the right. Um, and um, this is their marriage certificate, which I thought was really neat. And, and you know, when this, there's so many layers to the story, and one of the words that keep coming back to me was courage. You know, courage of um, Garuku to come to America to begin with uh, as, as an immigrant, which was not all that uncommon. Many people did that at that time. But um, Satsuno came at the age of 22 as a young woman, boarded a, a, a boat, a ship, to come to a country that she'd never been to, didn't speak the language, didn't know anybody, uh, to marry a man that she had never met. <laughs> uh, and the day after her arrival, they were married uh, in the Buddhist church in uh, Seattle. Uh, he signed the marriage certificate in uh, English, and if you can see there in the middle, lower part, she signed in uh, in Japanese. And so, just you know, the courage for her to come and do that I th is just um, you know just amazing. I thought. Um, and then after um, Garuka passed away, they opened a, uh, a Freshway Market on uh, South um, Main Street in the you know s uh, south part of Longmont here, where they sold vegetables that they that they grew themselves on the farm there, and they actually uh, had the vegetable business there up until 1968, which was long after they had developed uh, other interests. Um, and there's the more extended Kanemoto family in the early 1960s. Setsuno, the matriarch, is on the left. Um, George is in the uh, right on the right in the back there, and Jimmy's on the left um, with their children. Um, after their father died in 1935, the three siblings for a time left school to help their mother work on the farm and things, but they did eventually go back to school and, and finish their educations. Um, the two uh, brothers, uh, Jimmy and George, married sisters uh, who are of Japanese, the daughters of Japanese immigrants from uh, uh, Lafayette, uh, whose names were Chayo or Chayoko and Jane. So the two brothers married the two sisters, which I found interesting because my family, my father and mother also had um, uh, siblings who were uh, uh, the, uh, that were the same. And so I was kind of th 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 thought that was kind of interesting. But the, the two couples really formed you know, a partnership between the, the husbands and wives and between, you know, the, the two couples. They really forged a, a partnership um, together. Um, and, and then kind of getting back to the term of courage, you know, in the 19, late 1940s, the family who had been tenant farmers in the area south of Longmont here were offered an opportunity to, to go into debt to purchase the land. Uh, or at least a you know, portion of the land. And it was not an easy decision to make, but they, they did make that wise decision. But that, that took courage uh, as well. And then the big part of the story relates to um, World War II and the uh, uh, internment or uh, detainment, incarceration of, of Japanese Americans that occurred uh, at that time due to extreme xenophobia against Japanese people that occurred after World War II. But in Colorado, you know, um, uh, no persons of Japanese descent were actually incarcerated um, uh, because of, um, in large part, the attitude of, of Governor Ralph Carr, who was very much opposed to that. And in Longmont area, the neighbors and community as a whole really supported the Kanemoto family. They understood that they were being persecuted. They, they gave them support. And the Kanemoto family really appreciated that, and they, they never forgot about it. Um, so, you know, the other aspect of courage is the courage of uh, people like Ralph Carr to stand up in the face of what they knew was wrong, and the courage of neighbors of the Kanemotos to also to offer them the support of, of, of to do what was right and, and to be um, supportive of them at that time. Um, so, you know, they bought the land in the 1940s, and 
continued to farm it uh, until the 1960s, um, when at that time things were starting to develop in Longmont, especially to the south. IBM had come in on the diagonal, uh, FAA facility had come, and many other things were happening. And so the land, of course, became very valuable and ripe for development, and they decided to develop it themselves. They also uh, uh, went into uh, other enterprises, including the cane companies. They patented farming uh, type of irrigation uh, machinery. Uh, in the later years, as you can see in their advertising for the cane companies, which was located exactly the same location as where the Freshway Market had been located that the family had done earlier. Uh, but they used the Tower of Compassion in their advertising. And this advertisement actually was in a, a Jewish, uh, I'm sorry, a Japanese uh, uh, newspaper that was published in Denver that they advertised in uh, frequently. Um, so in early 1970s, um, Jimmy and his wife Choyo went to Japan and visited uh, uh, pagodas there and kind of hit on the idea of uh, building a pagoda. Um, in Kanemoto Park uh, to honor their father, but also as a gift to the city to acknowledge their, as an expression of their compassion and appreciation for all the compassion they've been showing them over the years, but especially during World War II. Um, the Kanemotos, when they developed the land and uh, the neighborhood, um, they donated the land for Kanemoto Park as well as the land for the Burlington School, which is adjacent uh, there and set that aside. And they did many other things in the community in terms of donating and, and helping uh, and became just really, really involved um, as, you know, great community members. And the two brothers had such, you could tell they had just such a special relationship between themselves as well as between the two couples. Jimmy was always the more extrovert, outgoing, kind of the front person. George was the person who took care of all the details behind. Uh, and so it's just kind of interesting to see their, how everything worked with the two families. And there's the two brothers, probably in the 1990s. Uh, Jimmy's on the left, George's is on the right. Uh, and I guess that's the last slide that I had, just a few slides. So, you know, in terms of the report, um, you know, um, great history, um, nice construction history, uh, did some research on the, the people who were involved in building it. I kind of gathered that a lot of their time and effort was donated. Uh, or at reduced cost. Um, otherwise, I think, you know, the Kanemoto family just pretty much took care of everything. The Tower uh, of Compassion was, construction was started in May of 1973, and in September of that year, they had a, a dedication that was attended by uh, the mayor, uh, the city manager, as well as uh, the governor of Colorado. Many other dignitaries uh, were there, and... Um, um, they just, you know, the two brothers just were very expressive of the, of the appreciation that they had uh, for the community back to the World War II days and also about um, what the tower represented in terms of, uh, of, of compassion. Uh, in terms of findings, you know, I, I don't think there's any question that, you know, I certainly evaluated it as eligible for local landmark designation as well as eligible for the state and national register. Um, we've had, um, you know, informal communication from uh, the state that they also believe it's eligible for the National Register. And, um, um, you know, I know you have internal discussions you need to have with parks and things, but if there's interest on the city's part uh, uh, to move forward with that, you know, I'd certainly be open to uh, becoming involved with helping that process through. Um, any questions? Yeah, perhaps could you explain a little bit about what that process entails to to be uh, a state and national landmark? Sure. Um, first of all, well, um, it requires the uh, preparation and um, submittal of a state and or national register nomination. Anything that's listed on the national register is obviously is automatically also listed on the state register. Um, but it involves um, a report similar to what we've done here with a little bit more detail um, and uh, um, maybe a, uh, a little bit more research, maybe fleshing out a few things. One thing, I, if I were to get involved, that I would want to flesh out, I did quite a bit of research on immigration law in the U.S., especially as it applied to Asian Americans. And um, 
uh, for a national register level documentation, I'd want to delve into that a little bit deeper or just flesh that out a little bit more. So just, you know, some, some modifications or uh, enhancements to the denomination just to add a little bit more detail. Uh, the nomination goes to staff there that reviews it and maybe uh, interacts with the preparer of the nomination in terms of uh, suggestions for edits or improvements. And then it goes before the um, state review board uh, for consideration uh, at a meeting of the state review board. And uh, the nomination preparer or owners of the property or people from the city would be welcome to come and speak on uh, behalf. Uh, they do put out, a, there's a, a formal process where there's a notice that goes out if anybody wants to object uh, to the nomination. And uh, at the, that meeting, the board makes a recommendation to forward the nomination or not, or to return it for corrections or edits. Um, but if they approve it, they approve it to not to forward it to the. Uh, uh, I think it's it's the the Board of History of Colorado, which is part of the Department of Education, and that's usually a formality. Um, if the State Review Board approves the nomination, it's pretty much guaranteed to go on, and then from there it goes on to the to uh, Washington to the keeper of the National Register, which is part of the National Park Service, where they formally would list it uh, in the National Register of Historic Places. The State Review Board meets three times a year, uh, January, May, and September. Uh, and then the, there's a deadline to have the nomination in for each, nom for each review board meeting that's maybe about three months prior. So for example, if the city was interested in uh, being on the May agenda, which might be pretty ambitious, uh, I think the, the deadline for that would probably be sometime like coming up in January. Um, I don't have the exact dates, but uh, it's usually maybe around three months in advance. Um, so that's kind of the, the process. All right, thank you. Any commissioners have any other questions or comments for Mr. McWilliams? Yeah, Commissioner Barnard. What's the, what about the uh, Historic Preservation Commission's role in all of this? Well, your commission, as I understand it, would be to, uh, I've, I've made an evaluation that it's eligible for local landmark designation and effectively have a document that's an application for designation. So my understanding is that your role at some point, and maybe you can listen to when that point would be to uh, make a recommendation to council in that regard, whether you not you agree with that evaluation or want to move forward. Uh, with the de designation. So your role would be at the local landmark level. Uh, and then just kind of getting back to the, the state and national, uh, this being listed on the state or national register does not add any or entail any regulatory uh, restrictions or imp impose any type of regulatory aspects to the, to the property. Follow up. Right. Let's come back to staff then, as far as what they, how they see this proceeding at the, at our level. So the first step, um, first of all, we, is continuing our basically ensuring that the the parks department is is on board. Um, ultimately, city council will have to basically direct staff to pursue landmark designation since it is a city owned asset. Um, with that. If we get that direction, um, then it would come back before this commission for review and recommendation to city council, who are the ultimate decision maker to um, dedicate or to designate the property. Thank you. So I'm just trying to understand if I were the mayor, city council person, how I'm going to give a direction without input from somebody. So we would basically present um, the report, that, the report that Mr. McWilliams prepared. Um, you know, we would make a presentation to council. Say staff recommends this. Um, do you wish to have? Do you wish to pursue this? And yeah, you know, if so, we will prepare the formal application package and send it through the process as defined in chapter 2.56. So, so could our direction tonight be a motion to recommend this to council to 
to, in other words, to not wait around for them to decide to put this on an agenda, but to like make a formal recommendation that they look at this. I think that would. I don't see I why think not. We'd all feel I don't probably a lot better I don't, about that. Yeah, I don't see why not. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Commissioner Fenster. I had essentially the same question, and that is, is there some action that we should be taking at this time, and does that need to be done in a formal motion? And if so, where, where does that go next? Just so that we don't have a lot of unnecessary delays. Yeah, I agree. Oh. Uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, um, the example I'm aware of is the silo, and that was brought forward by a Jason neighbor. So usually the first part of the application is you want to know, do, does the owner agree? Um, which is what I was thinking we would do just out of hand. Um, but if you want to give us direction to do that, please. But it will come back before you because then you will make a recommendation on whether it's a landmark and then we'll bring that ordinance back to council. So it's it's going to bounce back to you anyhow, right? I I, th I mean I feel like uh, the commission is all on the same page here. I think we ought to finish this yeah. this particular item with a motion to recommend moving forward to council with a request to make this a local landmark, even if that means asking them to ask us <laughs> <laughs> formally. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Uh -uh. I would move what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we uh, we have a motion on the floor to uh, recommend uh, that staff take uh, this report to City Council with a request that we start a uh, local landmark designation for the Kanemoto uh, Tower of Compassion. Adequately restated. Uh, so, so we have a motion by Commissioner Barnard and a second by Commissioner Jacoby. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. Motion carries. All right. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Williams, for an excellent report. And uh, it's just really fascinating, all the, the additional background. It's, Thank you all for yeah. the opportunity. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. Um, Sec second thought. <clears throat> Is there a prospect that this monument, memorial, will become a federal landmark at some point? And should that be encouraged or discouraged? Uh, I, I think it's a fair question. I, you know, I think part of that in Mr. McWilliams report he's noted that it's eligible or in his, his opinion at least uh, eligible for all three levels I think that would be part of staff's feedback you know introduction to council right uh, whether you'd want to take it it makes sense to take it further but you know that can be a council discussion I guess as far as how far it goes right Okay. Okay. Uh, our twenty twenty four commission retreat. So we have a we have a tentative date for that. Is that correct? Correct. So we have a tentative date, um, subject to approval of this commission this evening, of Saturday, February tenth. Um, probably a similar time frame that we did the last time. So one to four ish. Um, we have a room on hold at the Longmont Museum for this date for their um, larger meeting room, so plenty of space is spread out. Um, so Maria's been working on, on finding a location. So this is, um, I would anticipate, I mean, obviously at our January meeting, we'll establish you know, the meeting dates for 2024. Um, I believe I noted last at the last meeting that the regular meeting date for February conflicts with the Saving Places Conference, and I, and I know quite a few of us will be at that. So it seems that the retreat might reasonably t 
take the place of that meeting, um, but that is obviously something for this commission to um, to make it to de to decide. So, basically, what we're proposing this evening, we, uh, staff is um, proposing a date of February tenth for the 2024 commission retreat to be held at the Longmont Museum. And if we get that direction uh, this evening, uh, Maria will confirm the room and we'll call it good and start preparing for it. Okay, great. Uh, commissioners, any no objections to that date? Okay. Um, all right, then uh, I'd entertain a motion. Do we want a motion to move forward with that or is that just adequate direction to we, we have, all right, we're, we'll move to accept the, the date of February 14th for the... Uh, February 10th. For, sorry, February 10th. I'm looking at... Yeah, sorry. February 10th. Thank you for the correction. Yes, right. My bad. I was looking at something else uh, while I was saying that. February 10th, uh, 2024 for the HBC retreat. That's moved by Commissioner Barnard. Uh, I'm going to give the second to Commissioner Sibley since I was looking in that direction. All those in favor... <laughs> Aye. Aye. All right. There you have it. Okay. Um, now, on to our last item for this evening, the Historic East Side Conservation Overlay Update. Uh, staff, do you, Jennifer, do you want to walk us through I'm going to give this one to Glenn. Oh, okay. Great. Well, I'm going to give it to Rick Jacoby because he asked to put this on the agenda. So, um, as long as I get a chance to follow up. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm just getting myself to that point. All right, Chris Commissioner Jacoby. Colors, red and green here, yeah. so, uh, well, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, just to back up and give a little history, um, the neighborhood obviously has been pursuing the conservation overlay. We've hit, they have hit a road bump with regard to expenses. Uh, we have discussed as a commission before whether we think uh, any neighborhood group should have to endure the expenses of the planning fee in addition to everything else, and we agreed that that was not an issue. But when the neighborhood group went to city council to request this, they bounced the recommendation out to us. So to open this, I would like to just make it a formal motion. Um, I move that we recommend City Council direct planning to initiate the conservation overlay process for the historic Eastside neighborhood while waiving the planning fee and to support a waiver for the 1,000 foot peripheral area notification requirement. Second. Okay. So, we have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Jacoby and a second by Commissioner Barnett. Um, I'd like to have discussion on the motion. So, do any commissioners have any comments or questions? No? Okay. I, I have only a uh, question about where things are in the process so I can understand all this information that we've been provided. So, it's, am I correct in stating that, that there's been an initial pre-application conference and what we're talking about doing is is applying the overlay district um, rules that are already in the land use code as they are written to the to the east side neighborhood district. That's is that what we're. What? I want I want to understand exactly what it is that we're talking about as well. So sort of. Okay. So um, really, kind of where we are in the process is a. Um, Pre-application meeting has held. We was held. We've laid out a roadmap for what needs to happen. Um, it's not really as simple as this. The these rules just this applies to the east side neighborhood and zone it that way. There's quite a bit of research and analysis and standard development that needs to be done. So it's um, you know I'll, I'll I'll let Glenn pipe in, but it's 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 an undertaking, and you know part of it there is a lot of work that needs to be done before it gets to the level of going to council. Um, I think the fee waivers and the, notif the ra notice radius efforts, I'm going to turn it over to Glenn, are, are probably the easy part. 
Well, I think just, just to back up, we've been under the impression that an application is going to be made to us and we're going to evaluate it. We go to Planning and Zoning Commission. They make a recommendation. It goes to City Council. So that's when we did the pre-app, we did just like any other developer. And it might seem unfair because here's a group of neighbors that want to put a zoning overlay on their property. Um, but we gave a couple of first steps. One is, um, I think we told them, as far as notification, from my standpoint, we're good on that. Um, because it doesn't really affect adjacent neighborhoods like putting in a Walmart, for instance. Um, all we know is there, I believe, that they would like to change the coverage requirements. Mm -hmm. So we did a simple analysis for them. But really, the first step, even before they make an application, would be the neighborhood meeting. And we talked through how that happens. Staff facilitates that. Um, and then as what was pointed out, council said, bring it back to council. So they may direct staff to do all the work. And I think that's the assumption of the folks behind me is that we're working behind the scenes to put this forward and staff initiate it. So um, outside of that, uh, council directing us to do that, we are in the mode of waiting for an application that actually lays out what the new requirements, what they'd like them to be. There's also a provision for a set of design guidelines. I don't know if that's part of their plan either. Um, but one thing I just want to point out is it wouldn't come to historic preservation. It would be a planning and zoning commission and a city council decision. So it's, uh, it's a rezoning, and you typically wouldn't be part of the rezoning. Now, if they wanted to go forward with a historic district, that would be something that the HPC would be involved in. So, um, and we talked about this back on April 1st at our last retreat, and we went through the differences between CO and putting a historic district in place. And uh, a CO is zoning, which means Planning and Zoning Commission makes a recommendation, the City Council adopts it. It's not necessarily historic preservation. Um, I could see that it might lead up to it, or it could be preserving certain characteristics, but it's pretty clear in the code that it's, it's not historic preservation. Okay, thanks. So... Basically, what's being asked of us right now is just those simple two things, the, the, the f waiver of fee for the application and the waiver of the 1,000-foot additional buffer, period. That's it. That's all that's being asked of, of HPC to re make a recommendation to council to say, yeah. Your fellow commissioners asking yeah, you to right, say yeah, <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I understand this is um, under zoning, and so therefore it goes to P and Z. But really, that the heart of a conservation overlay is preservation. It's preservation of a neighborhood context. And so I think this, it, even though officially, according to code, the decision will be made through planning and zoning, I think it's reasonable for us to review this, and I think it's reasonable for us to uh, pursue this as uh, the Preservation Commission. Uh, as far I believe, Glenn, you, you suggested that they still want to consider uh, development within the properties. And, and as uh, Bob mentioned, I think that was dropped. It's certainly the, the way the, the, the language is written in the, um, the code, it is trying to make any additions to houses as far as size compatible with the rest of the neighborhood. Unfortunately, that doesn't work well in our neighborhood. The, the lot sizes are so variable that the largest lots with the largest homes, because the homes are already larger than neighboring homes, they cannot add an accessory dwelling unit, even if they have a large lot. And the smallest homes on the smallest lots would qualify, from this standpoint at least, uh, from the CO uh, guidelines. Now we, for an ADU, even though there's almost no space on the lot for them, they would have to follow other code guidelines for that. But as, as you know, we've discussed before, the, the home, uh, was it 426 Emory? You can fill a lot quite a bit. And so the smallest lots would 
potentially get very filled, the largest slots would have empty spaces. This was a problem for the neighborhood and we, when I was working with the neighborhood group on this, we discussed you know, a certain percentage size of uh, improvement footprint for each lot, doing it that way. And that came up against, well, how do you measure it? And there were two different measurements and it became a hornet's nest and we just said, let's drop that for now. Again, the, the point is the neighborhood would like to just move forward with the process. By recommending, by agreeing to my motion, we are not saying that we want the conservation overlay. We are saying let the neighborhood go forward with the process, which includes neighborhood meetings and feedback from neighbors that goes to city council and city council and planning and zoning and they can discuss it and pursue it with their judgment. But right now we're just trying to remove one roadblock so they can pursue that. Great, thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Any other questions or comments? No? Uh, in that absence then, I will call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion as stated, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? None, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, uh, that concludes the business portion of our meeting. Um, any further comments from HPC commissioners? None. None? Commissioner Jacoby. One final comment since sunset has come. Happy Hanukkah to everybody who celebrates. <laughs> No, uh, I, I have one very brief comment, uh, but I wanted to put it on the record. I've been thinking a lot about this commission and our um, the requirements that we have vis-a-vis uh, -vis landmarks, right, in light of some of these discussions, this um, about saving historic materials. And I, I guess I wanted to, to, it occurred to me that one of the reasons that we have this, that this commission exists um, is that the state has this pool of money that is al can be allocated to citizens of the community that buy historic homes and want to preserve them, right? And the way that we allow the citizens of our community to access those funds is by having this commission and upholding the rules that the state has set up for that process. So when someone, it's, it's even better really than an, than an HOA, right? People buy property to restrict themselves and their neighbors voluntarily. If you buy a local landmark property, you're restricting yourself voluntarily, but you're also part of a community that is able to access resources that you wouldn't otherwise be able to. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind when we're sitting here talking about these applications and why, why we're even here, at least it's specific to you know, COAs and that sort of thing. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, seeing uh, no um, City Council liaison, uh, I will accept the motion to adjourn. All right, all right. I've got a motion from Commissioner Jacoby and seconded by Commissioner Barnett. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wasn't trying to draw it all out, but I really just wanted to.